Hello, my minnow friends. I just love adding minnow to things. <laughs> and with so many women cringing about all things pertaining to menopause, I think we should just all add menopause before our first names. Menopause Barbie, Menopause Karen, etc. And then we should find ways to morph every word into a minnow word. <laughs> minnow power, minnow madness, minopocalypse, minnow popularity, <laughs> etc. <laughs> so here we are at video number 348. And it's the next in the sequence of videos on cervical cancer. As you know, I cover everything in units and every video builds on the last. So last week, we discussed the two screening tests that are available for cervical cancer and pre-cancer. The pap smear and the HPV test. Obviously, after you have a screening test that indicates the likely presence of cervical cancer or pre-cancer, you need something to make an actual diagnosis. Because thus far, all you have is the possibility of cancer or precancer. What you need now is to either confirm a diagnosis of cervical cancer or precancer versus rule out the diagnosis of cervical cancer or precancer. So today we'll discuss the diagnosis of cervical cancer and precancer. You won't find this in my book. I'm limited as to what I can include in my book, but here on YouTube, I have no limits. <laughs> so keep watching. Alrighty. So let's say you have either a pap smear or an HPV test that is positive for a high likelihood of cervical cancer or precancer. The very first thing for you to understand is that you do not yet have a diagnosis. A screening test is not a diagnostic test. Way back in video number 314 of our unit on, on cancer in general, I made the distinction between a screening test and a diagnostic test. In that video, you learned that there are criteria for a diagnostic test that are quite the opposite of the criteria for a screening test. A diagnostic test requires all the following. It must serve the individual patient rather than the public at large. It must be used for patients with either a positive screening test or symptoms indicative of the cancer. It may be expensive. It may be complex and of limited availability. It must be useful regardless of whether or not the cancer is symptomatic, meaning early or late. It must focus on accuracy in confirming the presence of the cancer. So unlike the case for a screening test, a diagnostic test has to be more specific for the precise disease. This is called specificity. Specificity pertains to confirmation of the disease. So now we're moving from a screening test which may lie about the presence of cervical cancer or precancer to a diagnostic test which will verify the presence of cervical cancer or precancer. So here's the comparison chart I showed you in video number 314 when we assessed the differences between a screening test and a diagnostic test. So you see that we're now focusing on a test for the individual patient that may, might be expensive or complex, that may be of limited availability, that can be done when you are either asymptomatic or symptomatic, is accurate in its ability to diagnose cervical cancer or precancer specifically, and does not lie. So let's paint the scenario of how this plays out in reality. You go in for your annual exam with no complaints or symptoms. You need a standard annual checkup, including your PAP or HPV, HPV test, your mammogram, and your annual labs. So your doctor performs your PAP smear or HPV test and sends it off to the pathology lab. He does that by, as I showed you in a previous video, 
taking either the spatula around your cervix or the brush around the cervix or this funny looking brush into the cervix. Now, a few days later, your doctor calls you to say that your PAP or HPV test came back abnormal and needs further evaluation. Diagnosis encompasses the procedures that your doctor must do to either confirm the presence of abnormal cells and label them with a diagnostic identity or rule out the presence of abnormal cells. When it comes to assessing your cervix, this involves two things, colposcopy and biopsies, and I'll discuss each of them. But first, let's review the anatomy of your cervix just a bit. This is my prop for your cervix. Now, obviously, your cervix is nowhere near this size, but for our discussion today, the large size is actually a good thing. This is a model of the female pelvis. If I turn the model this way, you can see all the way up to the top of your vagina, and that's where you'll find your cervix. Right there at the very top, looking like a bagel, there's the cervix. Now this model shows your vagina as an open space with the walls expanded. But you and I both know that the walls of your vagina are really collapsed against one another. So to see your cervix, your doctor inserts a speculum. That's this thing, okay? And with the speculum, your doctor can see into your vagina because the speculum opens the walls of your vagina to get a good view of your cervix. Your cervix is clearly visible to the naked eye, but for purposes of assessing the cells of your cervix, you need magnification. And the instrument used to magnify your cervix is called a colposcope. A colposcope is a microscope for the cervix. It's not a microscope like the ones that sit atop a table. Instead, it's mounted on wheels and designed in a way that enables pointing it at your cervix while looking through the eyepieces, both at the same time. I don't know about you, <laughs> but when I was a kid, the best gift I ever got was a microscope. <laughs> I was always somewhat of a nerd who just loved school, especially science. And all I ever wanted were scientific things. So while my girlfriends were getting Susie Homemaker ovens and kitchens or whatever for birthday and Christmas gifts, <laughs> I was getting science items. <laughs> My poor mom. She was like a cross between Martha Stewart and Julia Child, the most perfect homemaker ever. Gourmet chef, exquisite seamstress, meticulous housekeeper, fabulous decorator, incredible green thumb. But I wanted nothing to do with any of those things, <laughs> except the sewing. I mean, that was my first attempt at something that resembled surgery. So I loved sewing. And by the time I was 11, I made all my own clothes. Of course, that only served to make me even more odd. <laughs> because I wore coordinated outfits with skirt, vest, and tams instead of jeans. So you see, I guess nothing has changed. I still dress differently than everyone else. <laughs> and sewing was great because it was a bit like doing surgery. But the other stuff, forget it. Over the years, I think... I had five microscopes, a chemistry set, a geology kit, models of just about every body part, and my bedroom was all frilly and flowery with nothing but science stuff on my shelves. <laughs> I think I had a collection of insects, dead ones, so that I could look at them under the microscope. Test tubes of pond water, rocks, and all kinds of chemicals. You know, it's only now, when I look back, that I realize just how weird I was. <laughs> <laughs> My brother had none of these things, but I just couldn't get enough of anything pertaining to science. So for me, <laughs> a colposcope is an absolute marvel. <laughs> so to evaluate your cervix, 
Your doctor sits on a stool with the coposcope between their eyes and your vulva, like this. And you can look into your vagina all the way up to your cervix. The coposcope never even touches your body. It just enables your doctor to look through the eyepieces and see a magnified view of your cervix. Then, your doctor swabs your cervix with a liquid solution called acetic acid. Acetic acid is absorbed more by the abnormal cells of your cervix than it is by the normal cells. And it makes the abnormal cells on your cervix turn white. The white areas are the cells of interest. Here are some photos of cervices with acetic acid elucidating white areas of abnormal cells. Notice that all these photos show the white areas of abnormal cells emanating from the transformation zone inside your cervix. I taught you in video number 342 that the transformation zone is where all cervical cancers begin. It's the line between the squamous skin cells of your cervix down here and the columnar glandular cells of your endometrium up here. In other words, it's this line that divides the parts of your cervix that are visible and exposed to your vagina from those that are not. The white areas of acetic acid uptake indicate where your doctor needs to take biopsies. And then, with this pincher instrument, your doctor takes three to six biopsies, each about the size of a sunflower seed. And he or she sends all those biopsies to the pathology lab. In the pathology lab, the pathologist cuts each sunflower seed piece into about 15 smaller pieces. Then he or she stains them with a series of stains that make the details of the cells stand out. Then, they put each one on a separate slide and examine each one individually with a high-powered microscope. And, based on the appearance of the cells under the high-powered microscope in the pathology lab, the pathologist can give you an actual diagnosis. The microscopic diagnosis is so accurate that the pathologist can designate the precise degree of abnormality of the cells. Remember this? Gosh, I first showed you this way back in video number 311 on the progression of cell abnormalities leading to cancer. This is the parade of progressive dysplasias that represent pre-cancers and cancer. So the pathologist can specify whether your cervical cells show mild dysplasia, moderate dysplasia, severe dysplasia, or neoplasia. And just as I described for endometrial uterine cancer, there is the phenomenon of breaking the barrier. This is the point at which the disease transforms from a non-cancer to a cancer. In the case of cervical cancer, at the cellular level, it's when the cells demonstrate neoplasia. Before neoplasia, it's pre-cancer. Once you have neoplasia, it's cancer, but only if the neoplastic cells invade the surrounding tissues. And the degree of abnormality is what determines treatment. So this ability to really pinpoint the diagnosis is yet another reason you rarely hear about anyone getting cervical cancer. Most of the time, it is discovered by a screening test before it's even cancer, and the precise diagnosis is made early enough to treat it and cure it. But treatment depends on the extent of the disease, so that's what we'll address in the next video. The summary for today is that the diagnosis of cervical cancer or precancer is made by examining your cervix with a colposcope and taking biopsies that can designate the precise degree of abnormality in the cells. 
So this is where I'll stop today. I hope you'll be eager to come back next week and learn about stage and grade of cervical cancer. If you need me to help you with anything at all, please schedule a consultation at menopausetailor.me. Do not expect me to tailor everything to you and help you with your personal situation in a comment box. That's impossible. If you want my help, you deserve more than you can get in a comment box. You deserve a consultation. If you want to follow me, there are no requirements. You can just go to Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, or Instagram. And if you want to subscribe to my YouTube channel or my newsletter, it's quick and easy right here, right now. See you next week. Bye. <laughs>